two on the screen. I, I wish my church had that kind of a setup, honestly. Okay, I got a lot of pieces here, so I have to sort of work my way through things here. So let us be in prayer. Almighty God, from whom every good prayer comes, and who pours out on all who desire it the spirit of grace and supplication. Deliver us, O oh God, when we draw nigh to you from the coldness of heart and the wanderings of mind, and with steadfast thoughts and kindled affections, we may worship you in spirit and in truth through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And our first hymn is number 154. All hail the power of Jesus' name.
And it is the good news that I bring today to say that Jesus does tell us that all we need to do is ask for his forgiveness, ask for the Lord's forgiveness, and it shall be granted to us. <clears throat> now we'll have this morning's scripture reading, or first we're going to do the psalm, and we're doing Psalm 1, which is not too hard to find. And, uh, and we're going to do the second response. I want more songs in here than I remember. <laughs> together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. 
Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them this question, What do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? And they said to him, The son of David. And he said to them, How is it then that David by the Spirit calls him Lord, saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David thus calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one was able to give him an answer, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. Thus end the reading of the gospel today. Well, this is, I don't know if you, you, I think everybody here is familiar with the lectionary. You know, this is the, a, a, a way of reading pieces of the Bible. To, and so over a period of three years, you cover all, all of what some group of people think we ought to be paying attention to. And so if you've been following that, uh, uh, the selected uh, lectionary passages, and I don't know whether they have been or not, but if you did, you realize that for the past several re weeks, every reading was about Jesus dealing with various Jewish religious authorities of his time. And in each case, they have come to him with one or more questions that they thought, what, what did they think? Well, they thought it was going to result in Jesus saying something that they could use to get rid of him. You know, and and this, so this is the last one. In fact, as you heard at the very end of it, they said <laughs> after that they gave up. It wasn't going to work. They couldn't track him. So I think it's important to start off by paying attention to why did these religious leaders, uh, what, what motivated them to get rid of Jesus? I mean, he was out there preaching. What, what, what was the problem with that? Well, you know, it was it what he was saying, or what it, whether he was doing these miracles and, and good works and things that made him try so hard to ask? Well, what were they trying to catch him up? Well, they wanted him to give an answer that would get him in serious trouble. Why? Why? So I did a lot of pondering on this, and I did a lot of reading on this, and a lot of praying about this. You know, it seems to me that the access to important information is the real motivator in this case. And it's sort of a pattern that goes on elsewhere too, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Now remember, I mean, it's hard to remember because it's so different today, but in those days, well, the Bible is what we call the Old Testament. And the first four books of which are the Torah, which are the, 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 the most significant religious books. And where did, where did that exist? Well, the only place was in the temple. There was a copy. <laughs> Maybe there was only one copy, period. I don't know. And, and who could read it? Well, first of all, almost no one could read. So even if they had it, they couldn't read it. Okay? Nobody had a copy at home, and, and they couldn't read. And, and it was kept in the temple. So who were the only people who could ever have seen this? The religious authorities. And so all the people knew was the interpretation that those particular people were providing them. Okay? Who were the who were they? The, the scribes, the Sadducees, the Pharisees. And so by tradition and based on their knowledge of things that were not available to anybody else, their role was to provide explanations of what God expected of most Israelites. So they were the only authorities. And there was no way. I mean, how would you challenge something when you, when you have no basis on which to challenge? And 
You know, so I think authority describes what they're afraid that they were going to lose. And why? Well, because Jesus was saying things that were contradictory to some of the things that they were saying. So if Jesus was providing a different interpretation, well, that's a threat right there because how, if, if now, wait a minute, I'm hearing this from this group telling me I got to do these things, and I'm hearing this from this guy over here telling me I got to do this. Well, what's the first thing that this big group that's been around for a couple centuries wants to do? It's do something to get rid of this voice over here. And this is not an uncommon kind of thing for people who have authority for whatever reason. Okay? So today's passage sort of sums up his interpretation of how to be right with God and not what was being preached, of course, by the clergy. And he made it very clear that the focus of his being was on love as the most important factor in anyone's relationship with God and with each other. And he actually quoted the Torah, <laughs> which they all knew very well, as the source of what he was saying to them. So here they are, and I want to read you a, a quote here from Anna Case Winters. She's the author of a book called A Theological Commentary on the Bible. And I thought this was particularly helpful here. That the Pharisees, upon hearing how he had silenced the Sadducees, which was the week before, are back at him, and they sent in a lawyer who asked Jesus to select one of the commandments in the law, which is most important. Now, you've got to understand that the rabbinic tradition counted 613 laws in, in, in that scroll that was locked up in the, in the temple, all of which were to be respected and obeyed equally. Okay, so that's their, they, this is, wait a minute, we're going to ask him to, to pick out ones, and, there, and it says right here, according to them, that you're not allowed to say which one is the best, or the, the first or the most important. And so that's all of a sudden is a problem because Jesus answers, refuses to choose one, and instead he goes to the heart and center of the law as such. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And on these two, and this is the, these are the key <coughs> words that he said, is on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So he gave an answer that was important to him, but he gave the rationale as to why that didn't supersede what they thought it ought to be. Okay? And Jesus has spoken to the, the, the things that are most central to their shared faith tradition. Uh, the first one is from Deuteronomy uh, chapter 6, verse 5, and the second one was from Leviticus uh, chapter 19, verses 18. So, I mean, those were in the, those words, that, you know, that love God with all your heart, et cetera, et cetera, and the other one, love your neighbor as yourself, are already there in what we now call the Old Testament. And he's pointing this out to them. <laughs> You know, he's not, not, and she says he's not innovating. Those are the fundamentals he would have learned at his mother's knee. And what he says is something the Pharisees should already know. So they're put to shame. I mean, how can you respond now? Because they know that <laughs> they can't do anything with this. And so, you know, it's easy in retrospect, and for us maybe, to, to sort of look back and maybe be a little smug about, well, you know, Christianity and everything. Well, now, remember, before the printing press and books, where was the New Testament? And what language was it written in? And who could read that? Well, what was it, 300 uh, A.D., when, when the, the Roman emperor said, okay, this is now the official religion of it. You're all not Christians. Okay, and here's the, you know, well, yes, the monks and the, and were copying this and the, and the priests, but there weren't printed Bibles out for people to look at. You had to take on faith what the, the religious authorities told you. And then along, 
don't remember the year, wasn't it in the 1500s, this guy Martin Luther was also, actually he was a Catholic priest. Okay? And, and he said, wait a minute, things are not <laughs> adhering right. And, and, and called them out on it. And they, they, of course, threw him out. And, he, and hence the, what became known as the Reformation or the Protestant, <laughs> Protestant approach. And, and so we have that, it, it happened again. You know, it's all about restricting the knowledge. And so you can see now why in, in the Roman branch of the cat, so-called Catholic, which, which means universal church, they started doing services in English. And they started having it written, or in other languages, in, in Spanish or Italian or whatever. And, and which was a big move to bring that news out. All of a sudden, other people were able to see these things. So you got to get, I mean, there was a lot of reformations going on. So it wasn't just the reformation that became the, what are today called the mainline Protestant churches, but, but you got reformation within the Catholic church too. And so it's really fascinating. I don't remember, I don't know about the, the, the Orthodox branches of that. I don't know whether they had that or not. But it's sort of interesting seeing that these things sort of repeated. And what most people don't know is that this happened in, in Judaism, and it also happened in, the, in the, uh, the Muslim world. And so you had reformations there. And why you know that there are two major groups of Muslims, for example, what you don't know probably is that, you know, the, what are the, the Shiites and the Hittites, the, what's the other one? I can't so, remember. Yeah, so I mean, so you had those two. Well, one of those was a reformation of the other one, and that's why they still, they're fighting about this. <laughs> and that's a major part of what's going on. And if you look at, at what's going on in Israel right now, the Hamas group is the, they're the, the hardcore group, and the group that had been in charge of Palestine, which was trying to find ways to reconcile with the Jews, was the other side of that. So it's it's within that, and you know, and now this, this one, you know, no, no, it all belongs to us, and kick the whatever out. <laughs> you know, that's, that's the, the the other, so you've got this going on. In, in the Jewish religion, you've got several layers there. So you've got, so the, the most recent one, the, the most recent reform actually was taking place in my lifetime. And when I was a kid, one of the, the Rabbi Silver at a major temple in, I don't know whether it's Cleveland Heights or Shaker Heights, Ohio, was one of the leaders of a reformation and, uh, and one of my first professional boss, Harold Rubin, belonged to, a, to that branch of Judaism. And I remember they used to go to, go to temple on Sunday morning. We used to kid him about going to church. You know? So I mean, there's a lot of things that go on that, that have to do with who has the information and who has the authority to talk about it. But only Jesus is able to come in and, and, and explain these things in a way that, that you know, puts those fighters away and, and says, no, you're all wrong. <laughs> it should really be this. So that, those are all, all important things to know about. And I, I want to just mention, uh, finally, a, sort of a contemporary Christian example. This sort of happened right in my own family. Okay. I don't know if you, when we say Baptist, we're usually thinking of what, two branches primarily, with American Baptist, which was in New England, actually is pretty much similar to the old Congregational that, that the UCC was a major part of, or came, made it a major part of, but, but then you had the Southern Baptists, which had a, 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 they were more, I don't know what the word you want to use, but more, uh, rule-making kind of, uh, uh, of approach. Well, when uh, one of my sister's brother-in-law lived in, in Whittier, California, when they had an earthquake there, 
and they were they were very active in a Methodist church there, which was badly damaged by the earthquake. And so, and my brother-in-law wound up being the person who had to pull everything together and rebuild the church and everything. But there was so much fighting and infighting and grumbling. And I, that's not necessarily true of being Methodist. That's not my point. But this particular congregation, and they said, we're, uh, we're out of here. You know, he finished <laughs> rebuilding the church. And they, they said, we're, we're, we got to go somewhere else. So they moved north. Uh, in uh, uh, Northern California, and there was this really this Baptist church and a real active and everything. But something that bothered me about that, well, first of all, they had no affiliation with any kind of larger Baptist group. And then and I went went to some services. When I would visit, I would go to church with them, and, so, and I had to go to a special class because I wasn't a member of the congregation and they weren't sure that, that maybe, so I had to go to a class before the, the, the worship service where the, 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 the preacher reminded all of us that, you know, that we were the only ones who really had the proper religion and everyone else in the world was a terrible sinner and, and there was no hope for them. And, but other things that he did was uh, he was asking for confessions from the uh, from the pulpit, and so that tended to bring people in, and they were growing like mad. They had a, a, a brand new two-story education building. This was all from you know in a matter of a couple of years, and then all of a sudden he said, "Oh, by the way, two weeks from now I'm leaving because I'm called to start another church somewhere." I don't know. I guess called by God. So he gone. And within two years the church collapsed. And and you know, and all of a sudden, so they said, well, we'll try, and they moved to another Baptist church. Well, that was a church that was was affiliated with the American Baptists. Uh, they had a pastor who I really liked who said, let's all get together with all the other pastors in the area of all the churches and start doing things on the benefit of the community, which they did. And she could see this juxtaposition between one and the other. And so since then, she now sings in a Presbyterian choir. She had her children in a Catholic school. She, none of this was going to happen before <laughs> because all of these things happened. But it was because this guy was retaining the, you know, the real message that Jesus in this phrase talks about because what he was preaching was not love your neighbor it was you know here's how you get saved and forget everybody else and that and initially that that can be attractive if you feel you're you're in a tough position so these are all hard things but in conclusion what do I think Jesus is saying to us and his response and my take on his teaching is simple to say but the hard part is the doing. Because love is what's important. And authority isn't all about what it is. In a world where values, however, are ascribed based on what one knows or certain skills or where they came from or and on and on and on with a whole list of special things um, and all boiled down ultimately to money, there's a lot of challenges that encourage everybody to obtain and keep authority of some sort. I mean, all of us have, and it happens, you know. Even just, I'm driving down the road, I'm in charge of my vehicle, and somebody cuts me off. All of a sudden, my authority to be guiding my vehicle has been challenged. And how do I respond? And, oh, man, oh, man, it's hard not to be, you know, whatever. It's hard to love your neighbor. And, and, and when things are going wrong with everything, it's hard to love God and don't understand that God loves us because all these difficult things are happening to us. But that's the message I think that Jesus has is you got to work at those things. you got to try to do those things. And those are the important things. And so even when we try to subvert our negative reaction by using 
maybe more careful language than we might have. If, you know, even that, we can trip ourselves up to expose that our real response to a difficult person or a difficult situation is not a loving response. <laughs> Jesus was constantly demonstrating how to love without worrying about being lovable. And I love that line. Loving without being lovable. And respect and genuine caring for even the most difficult others. And I don't, did you read about in, in the news what has now been revealed about the youth, the, the Vermont youth facility and what is the wood, wood something was the name of it up north. It, when you read what the, what actually was going on in there, it was horrible, absolutely horrible, and it went on for decades. And so there were innumerable people. There were people who were decrying this and gotten and then got into a position of authority and did nothing to stop it. And you know, and it's sort of a reflection again of this. It's it's easier to say we want to do this than it is to do it. So when you're fighting with yourself to do the right thing, just keep in mind that we all have that problem. And Jesus is urging us, arguing with us, trying to get us to try to see a different way to do this. So just keep in mind his admonition to keep trying. And so together we can help each other to keep trying to get better at loving unlovable. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Now, our, sort of in line with that, I want to, our next hymn is hymn number 548, In Christ There Is No East or West. Uh, in other words, difference. And there are no differences because we think or see things differently. Thank you. Individual, even who 
apparently was so riddled with health problems that nobody took care of him. And, and for all of those who were injured, and, and I don't know what situation they're in, all those who died, all their families, all their, the whole community. And then think back too, that these things are happening in other parts, not just of this country, but imagine if you were on either the Israel soil or the, 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 the soil across the, 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 this imaginary line, uh, you just don't know what's going to be happening to you or what's going on. So we, Lord, we, we really ask that you would be with all those. If they're worn by illness, if they're wronged or oppressed for the weary and the heavy laden, strengthen them by your grace. And, and we ask that you would heal them by your consolations. And let the day spring from on high visit those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide their feet into the way of peace through Jesus Christ who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And we use it not as a temptation, but deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
this is you sit here, don't you? Yes. All right. So you may sit. <laughs> All right. And now, may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and love of God and of Jesus Christ. And may the blessing of God Almighty remain with you always. Amen. <laughs>